Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our workshop on artificial intelligence for security, research challenges and opportunities. This uh, workshop uh, tries to identify all the challenges and opportunities that the working group, group on security uh, that in, is, has, has been launched in the BDBA and the AIRO Association. And we would like to, we, we have prepared plenty of speeches where we will address all these challenges. So as we are many of us, I just want to introduce you the first presentation that is coming from Nithar, that he will detail how it is going to be the working group. So Nithar, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Nuria. Uh, I'm sharing now my screen with you. I think that you should see it. Is it okay? It's yeah. okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, so I'm Nizar Toulemat, uh, in charge of European Affairs for the Liszt Institute of the French Commission for Atomic and Alternative Energies. And I want to thank, uh, I'd like to thank all the organizers for giving us the opportunity to present to you uh, the security working group of BDVA. And I want to particularly thank Nuria for all the efforts for the organization of uh, this uh, uh, workshop. So this working group has been created to answer to uh, the particular context of security in Europe. Um, which industry represent 200 billion euro uh, in Europe and employ, um, employs about 5 million persons. The European Union published its security union strategy based on five uh, pillars. So uh, as you can see here, a future-proof security environment, tackling evolving threats, protecting Europeans from tourism and organized crime, and uh, developing a strong security ecosystem. Um, as an illustration of the importance of this topic for the European Commission, 60, um, uh, 600 collaborative projects related to security have been funded since uh, 2007 for an overall value of 3 billion euro. And in addition to the current uh, war program of the cluster three uh, digital U um, Europe work program uh, will probably launch uh, uh, some calls also related to pilot, pilots using AI for law enforcement. So, um, here I highlighted the specific topic in the European Union strategies that uh, could be relevant for BDVA DIRO. Uh, as you can see, um, building a future-proof security environment for EU citizens, relying on safe, secure, resilient, and interdependent physical and uh, digital infrastructure in such sectors uh, such as telecommunication, health services, transport, energy supply, space, finance, sectors that are of of high interest for uh, BDVA. Uh, in addition, um, enhancing autonomy and capacity in digital investigation and intelligence of uh, European Union law enforcement and security practitioners with the best use of uh, research and development to create new and innovative tools complying with fundamental rights, approaches integrating AI, space capability, big data, and HPC that will bring together research, innovation, and users actively involving the private sector and academia. Topics also uh, in the core of uh, BDVA DIRO interests. All that to tackle uh, evolving threats, possible uh, vulnerabilities of IoT networks, and future deployment of the 5G, sophisticated hybrid threats, malicious use of new and emerging technologies, or from their vulnerabilities. And uh, all this requires increasing cross borders and cross -sectorial, uh, sectorial operational data oriented uh, collaboration. So our working group has been um, 
um, sorry, uh, will work uh, inside BDVA Dairo uh, on to tackle these challenges. As we know, data is the fuel of security research. However, um, it cannot be done without big data AI and HPC uh, that. Um, play a major technological role to the, uh, in the deployment of the EU agenda on security. And also we think that BDVA Dairo can steer a roadmap to reduce the fragmentation and promote a harmonized environment that fosters practitioners' trust and long-term AI innovation, adoption and uh, uptake. And also we would like to play a role to foster the delivery of innovative, sustainable and efficient solutions toward um, a more secure um, society for European for Europe's citizens. Every, uh, of course, taking uh, into account and analyzing the social implication of increased AI adoption uh, in in um, for, for for this roadmap. So our working group has been approved by BDVA um, Board of um, Directors a month ago and more than uh, 35 organizations, member of BDVA Dairo has expressed an interest to, to contribute to this working group. As you can see here, uh, some of the, of, of, of the partners that already showed an interest in, um, in contributing to this uh, working uh, group. So we structured the working group according to uh, the five uh, pillars of the secure and resilient EU society and uh, citizen program. Each one of these pillar, uh, pillars match more than uh, one priority threat to the European Union and could involve uh, expertise related to big data, AI and uh, HPC. And furthermore, these topics are connected uh, to other sectors such as energy, telecom, health, transport, space, etc. Uh, addressed by other working groups in uh, BDVA Dairo. Uh, here are uh, the objectives and outcomes we expect to, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve, uh, help other task forces and working groups in BDVA to better understand and appreciate relevant aspects of security in the context of big data and AI, exchange knowledge by organizing workshops and other community events, develop an industry and stakeholders research and innovation approach for AI in security domain, foster community building including relevant industry and academic partners uh, not um, and also including uh, other uh, partners um, outside uh, bdva and strengthen uh, europe european autonomy by developing innovative technology and promote, promoting their adoption and ensure the inclusion of security topics in the new ai data and robotic ppp and support a European industrial strategy for security data sharing strategy. And we would like to create a well-recognized BDVA security community that can interact with the uh, European Commission and with uh, the European agency agencies. So this is a map of the uh, relevant stakeholders we, we, we are considering to interact with. You can see um, five, uh, I will say, categories of stakeholders. Uh, we are already uh, discussing with EOS and uh, EXO uh, to, 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 to exchange our experience and also uh, to, 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 to develop collaborations. Uh, of course, we would like to be linked. We are, we are already uh, linked to many um, ish 2020 and I hope, and I hope uh, shortly uh, Eurozone Europe projects. Uh, you, we think that it will be also relevant to interact with uh, international uh, organizations such as Interpol, Unicri, or uh, the uh, OECD. And of course, uh, one of our main uh, interests is to also be uh, interacting with uh, the different um, with the European Commission through uh, DG Home, DG Connect, DG Echo. D uh, uh, DFIS and uh, European um, uh, agencies such as Europol, NFC, CIPOL, Frontex, Eurojust, uh, EULISA, and uh, Eurocontrol. Our coming actions uh, will be to organize a brokerage event um, 
related to Horizon Europe Civil Security for Society calls, uh, cluster three calls uh, around mid-June. Uh, the creation of uh, focus uh, groups on uh, th th these five pillars of uh, the cluster three um, war program, infra, uh, border management, fight against crime and terrorism, uh, cybersecurity, and uh, disaster resilience societies. And we would like to prepare a white paper on challenges and opportunities uh, for AI and big data for security. And thank you very much for uh, your attention. And if uh, you want to contact us, uh, Vito Moriale and uh, myself are the co-chairs of this working group, and we will be pleased to welcome you, to welcome your contribution, and uh, to ask to any question and request. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nisa. So the next presentation uh, will be from Gabriel Junta that uh, will, will address how to face the physical protection and resilience of critical infrastructure. Please, Gabriel. Sorry. Um, let's start sharing again. We do see a screen, but we see the, the browser. Can you see my screen now? Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Junta from Engineering Engineering Informatica. I'm the head of the unit of Smart Transportation and Critical Infrastructure. And today I'm going to present uh, a big data and artificial intelligence based solutions for protecting a critical infrastructure. Um, before starting, uh, uh, I give you a few information about what critical infrastructure is and uh, also um, on the risk and resilience assessment as well as the situation awareness and assessment. And then uh, I'm going to present uh, um, artificial intelligence and uh, big data solution um, for uh, protecting, for detecting cyber physical threats and uh, for uh, uh, data uh, visual analytics. And then I conclude my presentation with a few insights for the future work. Uh, briefly, uh, as I also mentioned before, uh, critical infrastructure, according to the new directive on uh, crit uh, critical infrastructure protection, is an entity uh, located in one of the member states that operates in several sectors. In the new directive, there are 10 different sectors, uh, like energy, transport, uh, banking, health, uh, space, and, and finance, and others. Uh, the critical infrastructure is critical because uh, uh, it provides uh, one or more services that are essential for the societal functions and for the economic uh, activities. And when a disaster or uh, a crisis occurs, uh, it will have a, a significant if destructive effect on the, the providing uh, such uh, essential services. So uh, it is uh, relevant to ensure the provisioning of the such service, uh, essential services and uh, to, in to enhance the resilience of the critical infrastructure against uh, different kinds of uh, uh, threats, so like natural hazards, accidents, terrorism, inside threats, public health, health emergency like pandemic, cybersecurity threats related to risk that are mostly addressed in the new uh, directive uh, needs to. Uh, but, uh, how to protect uh, critical infrastructure and how to increase uh, its resilience. Uh, I think it is important to, to, to focus on the risk, resilience, and situation assessment. Uh, risk assessment is uh, the, in our understanding is the quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis of the risk and the main factors like likelihood and impact. Uh, evaluated for each other, uh, of the, like the, the mentioned, the, the previous mentioned, or uh, for each uh, element or assets of the critical infrastructure. Uh, normally, the, the likelihood uh, depends on the threats of the hazards, and the key impact depends on the critical infrastructure assets or the critical infrastructure elements. Regarding the 
the resilience assessment, it is the, the estimation of the impact that uh, we have in terms of the loss of the functionalities when uh, a malevolous event or uh, a disaster strikes. Uh, immediately after the event strikes, uh, we have a loss of a functionality. In the, most, in the best case, the, the level of functionality might be recovered, also according to some improvements or adaptation and transformation that we can bring into the hardware infrastructure when the infrastructure is uh, uh, well uh, resilient. And the, 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 the final, uh, after a disrupt, the disruption time, the final level of functionality is uh, even higher than the previous uh, one when the, the, the event strikes. Um, but in the worst case, we can have a loss of functionality that cannot be recovered. In that case, uh, the resilience of the infrastructure has to be improved. Uh, according to the situation awareness and assessment, uh, uh, the, the, the state of the heart is mainly based on the Hensley data model, on the Hensley ontology model. And it, is, it consists on the three main elements, three main level of uh, um, situation awareness. The first level is when the perception of the, the elements of the current situation is uh, um, evaluated. The second level is uh, the comprehension of the perceived elements. And the final level is to predict how the situation might be evolved in the future. In the, future. Uh, the assessment of the, the, situ the situation awareness is done normally through a set of different indicators. Here, there is not a not exhaustive list of indicators like space to evaluate the relationship between the different events belongs to the same situation or time for the predicting how to evolve. Uh, might be might involve the, the situation or the warning level assigned for each element or asset of the critical infrastructure. The priority level is instead in terms of a cyber physical event uh, uh, evaluation, so priority of the events that we have detected, and performance level it normally is something that uh, um, pass through uh, is done through the post event analysis or so something that is is done normally after the the disaster. All uh, the data that we can collect from such uh, uh, different pillars of view of the, of the critical infrastructure protection life cycle are completely useless without an underlying data model able to structure different data sources. Here in this picture, we have uh, um, data sources for the sensor data collecting from uh, the available sensor installed in the critical infrastructure or the cyber physical threat data collected by the cyber physical detectors, also that uh, them installed within the, the infrastructure, or the risk and resilience assessment uh, data collected through risk and resilience tool data. Uh, the cyber, um, the critical infrastructure status data are uh, uh, something that we can uh, collect using the existing systems, the existing uh, control systems available in the infrastructure in order to have an understanding how is the status of the infrastructure before, during, and after the crisis. All together have to be correlated, have to be put, to, to put in a unique uh, situational picture framework and uh, uh, having a clear in mind what is the current situation, we can in case adopt the best mitigation strategy to recovery or to a high, high height, uh, the, the, which kind of country meters have to be activated. We talk about uh, uh, cyber physical detection tools. Here uh, is where the application of the artificial intelligence has the first concrete adoption. Uh, we have a different cutting edge technologies and they are going to be used mainly to extract uh, information and knowledge in order to detect uh, cyber physical threats. At the same time, moving a, a bit up into a logical schema, we can have a, 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 second, a second adoption of the uh, um, artificial intelligence in terms of uh, uh, descriptive, predictive and prescriptive big data analytics. A big data analytics that can provide us uh, uh, a view uh, of the data in the right context. Uh, the identification of the relevant information extracted from the current data and the extraction, of course, of the knowledge for further analysis. 
the transformation of the raw data into, into a form that make it easier to understand and to uh, rearrange or to manipulate, it is, can be really helpful to, for decision making within uh, the critical infrastructure. Uh, last but not least, it is also important uh, to have uh, uh, visual analytics because uh, having um, everything understandable to uh, the security operators, so we have to use uh, uh, different kind of visual analytics. We have, uh, for instance, a visual analytics for composition, meaning that uh, it is, for instance, possible through some kind of pie charts or histograms to have a percentage of cyber physical events that have occurred in the critical infrastructure but we can use also graph for distribution in the, against the time, like uh, um, the, the amount of time that the SIPs or the critical infrastructure stays in a critical state, or space, like the georeferences data about the critical infrastructure assets. Uh, but we can use also graph for comparison. Uh, for instance, the total amount of time in which each event has been detected by the cyber physical uh, detectors involve the specific type of assets might persist in a mitigate or in mitigation status. I'm going to conclude to say that uh, actually the research challenges are still to be overcame. There are a lot of improvements and a lot of work that is still to be done mainly in two different uh, areas, let's say. Uh, big data algorithms, uh, in that case uh, we would like to develop a new algorithms uh, to extract additional knowledge because the, the environment where we are working is a continuous changing environment. And in terms of the visual paradigms, uh, in order to represent uh, much better, so in a so effective and efficient way, our knowledge. Thanks to you for, uh, for your attention and uh, I will be available for, uh, for your questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I would like to remember everybody that you can make questions using the chat. Uh, up to now, nobody used the chat except me. So please, uh, yes, if you have questions, we can reply then, then after the speaker or at, at the last time, at the, at the last speaker, we can also reply to, to the questions. Um, now, uh, the next uh, speaker is Anastasio Ustimou. Uh, he will talk about artificial intelligence for disaster resilient societies. Please, Anastasio, get the floor. That's us, we cannot hear you. Hi, can you, can you hear me now? Yes, no. Okay, great. Uh, I guess you can see my screen too, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm here to, uh, uh, to uh, to talk about uh, data in, uh, in disaster management. Uh, I'm Anastasios or Tassos, uh, uh, who know me a bit better. Uh, Dimu, uh, I'm working for, uh, for CERT and the uh, uh, Information Technologies uh, uh, Institute. And um, uh, I'm uh, a researcher uh, here. Um, so here are the contents of, uh, of my speech today. Uh, I'm uh, going to give you uh, a, a context about um, the, the data that we have uh, in, the, in disaster uh, management. Uh, what are the challenges that we have uh, in, this, uh, in this domain? 
um, how artificial intelligence is uh, uh, is uh, here to to help and uh, to to see some examples of how uh, AI is used in the uh, in different stages of the disaster management cycle and also some uh, uh, key requirements that uh, AI applications uh, should have in order to succeed. So um, uh, we have been hearing about uh, how data is uh, uh, the new uh, oil for more than a decade now, and in some uh, and in uh, some of uh, uh, some sectors, uh, this has become a reality, but uh, not in disaster management. Uh, we have some uh, promising results, but there are many barriers uh, uh, associated with the highly complex and volatile environments uh, that, um, uh, that uh, we are operating. So, um, uh, factors that need to be, uh, to, to be uh, considered uh, are uh, first constraints on, on the data access and the completeness of this, uh, of this uh, data. So we have fragmented data uh, in private and uh, pl public uh, organizations. Uh, there is no uh, comprehensive framework or principles for, uh, for data sharing. Uh, second, uh, there are some challenges regarding the action of actionability and the reliability of this uh, uh, data. So we have uh, uh, big data sets and, uh, and uh, streams, uh, but um, uh, there are issues in the reliability of this data and how representative they are. Uh, that can uh, uh, hamper the validity of the findings uh, from this, uh, from the analysis of this uh, data. Uh, also, there are um, uh, gaps uh, related to the human and technological uh, uh, capacity, uh, especially um, uh, among different uh, different uh, countries. So the capacity to gather and analyze uh, uh, data and uh, its integration into uh, policy making and uh, planning um, are still uh, uh, lacking. And um, all this big data that we have has outpaced our ability to, to, to make sense uh, out of it. And uh, uh, especially in, uh, in uh, countries and in areas where they already lack uh, uh, human and uh, technical capacity due to underfunding. Uh, there are also bottlenecks in uh, effective coordination, communication, and uh, uh, self-organization. So uh, the knowledge that is needed to, to inform uh, risk assessment for preparedness and for uh, response uh, efforts, uh, they, they come from many different sources and they are uh, rarely coordinated. And, uh, and another barrier here is also uh, socio-cultural and uh, psychological factors that are often ignored. Um, and uh, fifth point, uh, very important, is the ethical and political risks and considerations. Uh, so um, uh, the, the potential of uh, the potential dangers from the use of uh, of uh, uh, big data. Uh, is uh, is something that it is um, um, that needs to be uh, uh, also considered, and there is an urgent need for developing some some guidelines uh, in the use of uh, of this data uh, uh, and uh, the ethics uh, in this uh, in this use. So um, uh, digitalization is uh, is a key word uh, when we are uh, when we are talking about uh, big data. So moving from the from the paper to uh, to computers in order to to transform raw data into a form that is uh, machine readable and it can be uh, analyzed. And this is a huge uh, uh, challenge, especially for a domain that it is uh, trained to operate under the assumption that there is uh, no communication or infrastructure available. Um, 
However, uh, nowadays uh, uh, the, the data is uh, the data sources are more organized and, uh, and more and more are uh, available. Uh, some of the most important ones um, uh, include knowledge hubs, remote sensing, uh, IoT devices, uh, sensors on uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, maps and georeferenced information and also uh, uh, social media uh, or uh, crowdsourcing uh, or information from crowdsourcing. Um, so uh, we had small data streams that have now uh, turned into floods of information uh, and, uh, and we need to, to deal with, uh, with this now. Uh, AI is uh, supposed to, to, to come for the rescue uh, uh, here, uh, but uh, before we, we do that, we have to, uh, to, to climb up this, uh, this uh, pyramid that uh, shows us that there are uh, many uh, steps uh, that need to be taken into account in order to uh, achieve our goal and have uh, really um, uh, efficient artificial intelligence. We have to collect the data, to store it, to sanitize it, to label it, uh, to learn uh, new models and, uh, and new tools and, uh, uh, and uh, reach our goal, that is to, to use artificial intelligence in order to, to uh, solve uh, uh, aspects of, uh, uh, of the disaster management. So uh, uh, the, here you can see the disaster management uh, cycle, and uh, in each stage there are uh, different uh, tools that are being developed. Uh, uh, in mitigation, we have uh, long-term uh, risk assessment tools, uh, tools for forecasting and uh, uh, predicting. And um, and the, in the blue box you can uh, you can see uh, what. Uh, what type of data are, uh, are uh, usually uh, used for these purposes. So for mitigation, we have uh, uh, satellite, uh, uh, satellite information, uh, social media um, uh, and crowdsourcing IoT data, and uh, also we have simulation tools that are used for this uh, purpose. Uh, in the preparation stage, we have uh, hazard detection and monitoring as tools uh, and different early warning, uh, early warning applications. Uh, also here, you can see that we use um, uh, um, uh, a rich list of uh, of uh, different data and the and the fusion uh, of this data for these applications. In the response stage, uh, we have uh, different situational awareness tools that are uh, uh, trying to, to provide common operational uh, picture and also uh, coordination, uh, efficient coordination and uh, and response. Uh, in the recovery stage, we have uh, uh, we have tools for uh, damage assessment and uh, also uh, infrastructure uh, restoration. Of course, all these are uh, uh, some indicative categories of, of tools that are uh, that are being built with uh, with uh, AI. Um, the the reality is that. Uh, uh, First responders and uh, authorities are mostly employing right now um, AI in the uh, mitigation and in the preparation uh, uh, states and um, uh, tools uh, that are using AI for for the for the response and uh, and the recovery uh, phase are um, uh, are tested, but uh, they are uh, uh, dealt with some uh, skepticism for, uh, for their uh, reliability um, during, uh, during the, um, the, the disaster uh, uh, response uh, uh, activities. So, uh, closing up, uh, key requirements that uh, an AI application should, uh, should 
take into account. Uh, we have uh, we need effective multi-source uh, uh, data collection, uh, efficient uh, data fusion uh, uh, exchange, and the ability to to query the data that we collect. Uh, we need to have uh, a, a control of the quality of, uh, of the data and to, uh, to promote standardization. Uh, we, have, uh, we need uh, real-time uh, big data analysis and uh, uh, decision support. Uh, of course, user-friendly uh, 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 visualization, and this also includes different abstraction levels in visualization. And uh, last but not least, uh, ethical and political risks and uh, considerations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Anas. Um, we have a question for, for you. Mm -hmm. Number in authorities. How tricky is to deal with text data in different languages for DRS applications? Yes, it is, uh, uh, it is a challenge that it is uh, uh, well known, especially, um, uh, especially in uh, uh, different uh, uh, insurag expeditions where uh, we have first responders from, uh, from uh, different uh, uh, parts of the world. Um, it is, uh, of course, there is, there is uh, some, some, uh, some conventions that, that help communication, but, uh, uh, but it is a barrier that is, that is well recognized also by, uh, by IFAFRI, uh, the, the uh, first responders uh, uh, network. And um, there is actually uh, a, a lot of work on uh, uh, designing applications that are uh, automatizing this, uh, this uh, uh, translation between, uh, between first responders. But for sure, uh, it is a, a, an important issue. OK. Uh, I think there's no more questions, no? Um, thanks. Thank you very much for, for your speech. Thank you. Um, now the, the following one is Sam Gaines uh, with Big Data and Artificial Intelligence for Preventing, Detecting and Investigating Criminal Activities and Terrorism. So Sam, you, you have the floor. Just give me one moment. Almost ready. Sorry. Share screen. Uh, are you seeing my proper display or do you need to spot? Uh, display settings you need to change. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. we see it. Yep. Hi. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to try to do in about seven minutes what's taken me over seven years to learn and just try to highlight a few differences that are very, very specific uh, to how you deal with data and artificial intelligence when we're talking about the fight against crime and terrorism. I'm not just going to talk about technical parts. I'm actually going to talk more to do with policy parts and so on. But let me just uh, fire into the presentation. Uh, we'll do a few things. I'll talk about some peculiarities, some of the challenges, some of the current practices, some recommendations that have been floated around for quite a while on how to deal with some of these issues. And I'm also going to make some specific comments on policy and legislation that goes well beyond the GDPR, just the GDPR, that uh, will be typically of what's of concern in the BDVA and DIRO. And also list out some reference projects in case anybody's got a taste to learn a bit more. Uh, I found this cartoon yesterday on the right, and it kind of sums it all up. You know, an autonomous vehicle being pulled over by an autonomous police car and asking why. Um, I wouldn't laugh about that too much. The, the autonomous vehicles and automated driving functions are actually going to be a bit of a headache now for law enforcement in the future when they have to deal with accident investigations, when you have sensor sets or automated uh, uh, decisions being taken on a vehicle, and never mind dealing with vehicle forensics. Uh, let me move on. For those who are not familiar with the field, uh, it's got some peculiarities you have to be aware of. Uh, sharing of data is not necessarily a technical issue. It's a cultural issue. Okay, It's an organizational issue. It's got to do with the end users themselves wanting to share the data and trusting those they share the data with. 
This is particularly the case in intelligence, for instance, or in ongoing investigations. However, people who might work in forensics who are more more in, more concerned with conviction rather than prevention would be more willing to share data because they're, it's after the fact. Uh, as the trust reaches beyond the data itself, I'll just mention that. When you talk about the province of the data, where does it come from? You know, in a big data uh, or an artificial intelligence application, uh, knowing where your data come from is, is financial. It's uh, got to do with the value of the data. In the case of FCT, it could uh, affect your chain of custody. And it affects your chain of custody, and you can't explain where the data came from or where the result of the analysis of data came from. It could mean that it's not admissible in court. So it's going to be of no use. You also have to bear in mind that uh, any technology to be adopted by a law enforcement agency is looking for a force multiplier. They're looking for it to be able to increase their capacity and capability. Uh, Tass has mentioned in his presentation, there's a yeah, pacing problems, particularly pronounced in the uh, FCT area. It's not just the organizational change be able to adopt new technologies. It's also they are in their, under their, they've got the, another problem where the people are trying to work against, which are criminals or organized criminals, and terrorists are actually just organized criminals as well, generally can adopt technologies first and don't have the same restrictions that a uh, law enforcement agency would have. <clears throat> In law enforcement, there's three main growth macro areas, which is horizon scanning, intelligence, and forensics. Luckily enough, that matches up very nicely with the big data uh, idea of foresight, insight, and hindsight. So you know, if everybody wants to look at that afterwards. Remember, a lot of people tell LEAs and AI and all new technologies are panacea and that's been proven over and over wrong. So the management of expectations is incredibly important. Some of the challenges. Uh, so we're talking about machine learning with data driven. In the case of dealing in LA, uh, FCT research, this is often a large amount of handcrafted data, which is structured. Yeah. In the case of supervised learning, the human is always in the loop in the operational stage. So quite often in the training of data, uh, using training data, I should say, in the research and development phase, often humans loop there. There's no systems are used to make automated decisions in FCT. There's always an analyst or an agent involved, a human person. Uh, as is the case for most people, if you most other areas, if you've got fake data or artificial data, it leads to poor representation and bias. Bias is generally much more serious when it comes to do with criminal investigation or the prevention of crime than it is in, in other areas. The GDPR uh, requires data minimization. Now, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, Nonomization, pseudonymization, not the only two techniques that have to be considered. Remember, if you're going to use these technologies in operational stages, you need to be able to actually know where you got your result from, because that could be a suspect or could be a piece of actual intelligence. Data sets are generally not available because they can't be, and there's no sense of information. Even the structure and the standards of the data is often confidential. And then when it comes into doing research and development in these areas, doing evaluation and benchmarking is incredibly difficult. Quite often what we have to do is actually take the results of the, of, of the developments and throw them over the wall into the law enforcement agency's own offices and ask them to evaluate or ask them to perform transfer learning. Now, there are some initiatives going on looking at blind interfaces to realistic data, but that's, that's still early stages yet. Some of the challenges, like I said, so it's a, data spaces are a current pre-existing issue at member state, state level, but also even within law enforcement agencies, agencies themselves. So that can be within an agency or inter-agency cooperation within the member state. So depending on depending on what country you're in, you may have one national police force, or you may be in a country like my own, where I'm living, and we have a number of national, regional, local, and municipal police forces. So even data sharing between them is an issue. So therefore, data space is an issue. Uh, I mentioned earlier about criminals being early adopters. So I have also, it's also worth mentioning, I think, and Nizar mentioned earlier that the availability of high performance computing, on demand computing resources like cloud computing, off the, off the top, off the shelf solutions, which are typically used in other areas of artificial intelligence, big data are just not valid in the FCT field. There's always an adaptation required. Some of the practices that we generally use in these projects are to try to minimize some of the challenges. Having LEAs or varying levels of maturity in your consortium is very, very useful or within your cooperation. And that can be actual operational, technical or technological, but also domain knowledge. And you must understand that uh, depending from country to country and from law enforcement agency to law enforcement agency, the level of maturity dealing with the technology or actually using technology applied to the problem varies very, 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 very significantly. Um, if open data sets that already exist in scientific research are perfectly valid in FCT research, but you must scrupulously triage 
the use of those in a, in a project. You don't internalize any data privacy or data ethics problems. And you want to use a structured approach, which uh, this uh, information available on the service website on that, for instance, because we have seen situations where the same process has been applied to, to the same data set and been inject, rejected for use in one project and accepted for uh, 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 use in another project for whatever reason that might be. Uh, moving on, uh, strict legal and ethical, ethical and legal scrutiny is uh, if it's required if you're collecting data sets, particularly if you're talking, let's say, things like darknet and so on. And the heterogeneity of data is a particular issue here in uh, law enforcement. Uh, for instance, you can talk about encrypted smartphones, you can talk about hard drive images, uh, we can talk about named entities, for instance. Uh, named entities are a huge thing in, law, in, in intelligence. Uh, it's not just the usual toponyms times, dates, it's much broader. But you get down to chemical trace data, explosives information data, stenographic data, and also structured information centers for referrals. One other comment as well, big data can be quite small at times in the law enforcement area, particularly FCT. If you have a pen drive which has criminal evidence on it and it's only a couple of images but they're encrypted, that's what we need to crack, that's the problem to crack. Uh, it could be very difficult, but that's what would solve a case or will lead to a prosecution. However, uh, you might also have some referrals for online service providers coming in from the US, and you could have a referral coming in that could be terabytes in size with the data that they've uh, collected for investigation. Uh, some recommendations dealing with data, particularly in FCT, uh, that we're, we've been pushing as a community for quite a while, is to have access to really realistic and pre-existing data. So for instance, data that was actually used in a prosecution or investigation to have it anonymized in some way, but have it to be realistic, okay? Uh, to also have some horizontal actions for the support of creation of common data sets and also on the training and facility data and ethics management of such data. Also, continued encouragement to law enforcement agencies to share data. Um, and these are mentioned that earlier on today. There may be some of them that soon. And then we also have to deal with the uncertainty and the permissiveness of the GDPR for FCT research. So uh, before the GDPR, depending on the country, you could just, uh, in Spain, it was the organic law on the protection of data was Article 22C. If you had data which was for the fight against organized delinquency, which is or a crime or terrorism, you just had to declare that the file existed and no more. And we could also use data under Section 4 of that law. And we could use data for training and formation, which is poorly translates. So we could use it for research, but the GDPR uh, reduced that, particularly under Article 5. And then we also have to consider careful consideration on how we do the uh, how the new proposed AI regulation will have effect at the moment or will actually get an exception or derogation for terrorism, but then again, not organized crime. And you can actually define terrorism as uh, a crime that is organized, but it's a crime of belief. Um, if anybody's working in this area or is better working in this area, some things that you need to consider limitations and derogations. So if this presentation is uh, shared later, those clicks will bring you to the right one. So as I said, uh, we do have limitations and derogations on the GDPR, which we didn't before. Now, that's for us as researchers or industry, but if you're going to use it with an end user, it's the police directive, which is transposed to national law, so they have their own directive to deal with uh, GDPR, or sorry, the personal data. And then we've also got to deal with the European Europol regulation if we're dealing with anything that passes through Europol, which in certain crime areas it does. And then we also have to deal with the European Union Classification of Information Directive, which then has its national transpositions under EU, it's under national law. So you may have a case in a project where you need to receive some uh, what's considered to be classified information and not necessarily top secret. And the law may say that it must be sent by registered post on a CD and it has to be sent on a, by registered post on a CD, not by DHL and not on a DVD. I mentioned some national legislation. These are mentioned earlier international treaties, such as Europol, sorry, excuse me, Interpol, Unicri, you know, the UNODC. And also I've mentioned the proposed AI regulation. The secure union strategy is a fantastic place to look. And also when anybody's considering uh, uh, the use of the technologies, um, you should look at this uh, directive 0428 in 2009. It deals with uh, data export or export of uh, of materials and other sort of anything that can be used uh, has has a dual use. So this gives an extra an extra importance on the dual use of technologies in, outside of the civil field, but also on the issue of data residency. And there are very, very few absolute, very many gray areas in FCT research uh, when it comes to data. So, for instance, social media. Um, if I scrape from, from Facebook, is that a GDPR infringement? Is that a lack of informed consent? 
is it a, an infringement of terms of service if I go in through an API for Twitter, Twitter explicitly says law enforcement agencies can't use their, their API, but then if you have a judicial order and operational use, everything's open. In the case of CSEM or CSAM, which is child sexual exploitation material, or child sexual abuse material, in that case, you just can never have the data. You just can never possess it. So it's not an issue. You just never have the data to work with. Even the law enforcement agencies themselves, there's only certain people that are authorized to access that data. Uh, some relevant projects, I'll just uh, leave that on the list so you can have a, a quick check. Um, I personally have some favorites there, such as Asgard and Starlight and Anita and Trillium. Uh, Roxanne is another interesting project, and I have to give out some uh, shout outs to Magneto and Provision for this next reason. Um, a colleague of ours, Costas from ICCS, basically led me to copy and paste most of his presentation that he did at a data workshop uh, last year in, in Brussels on this particular issue. So Costas, I don't know if you're connected, but we are. Thank you very much. You saved me a lot of time. And that's all I have. So thank you, Sam. Uh, there is no questions for you at the, at the moment. Um, uh, so I give the floor to the next speaker. Yeah, uh, there is a question for Sin, actually. Oh, uh, yes, there's a question. Uh, I, don't, I cannot see that one. So if you can say that. Yeah, it says it's from Ernest, Ernesto. Hello, Sam. Uh, I don't how, see that one. Okay. How ready are, are the AI technologies to address crime prevention, especially in compliance with legal and ethical constraints? So I could just repeat the question, please, Pablo? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, hello, Sin. How ready are the AI technologies to address crime prevention, especially in compliance with legal and ethical constraints? Uh, the truth of the matter is, Ernesto, I don't really know. Um, uh, if, if we were to go back, let's say, 10 years in previous projects when big data was becoming a thing, uh, we start to get a handle on how we would deal with large amounts of data. But the, the actual situation and compliance of artificial intelligence with the standards that are being proposed and with the proposed AI regulation, uh, they've contemplated ideas of how to deal with some sort of organized crime and terrorism, but it's not entirely clear. I, sorry, Ness, I just don't have the answer for you. I just don't have an answer to the question because I, I just don't know. Um, I, if there's another domain expert on the on the on the in attendance, please do say something. I would do like to do, I, I, I actually answer a question I haven't been asked, but uh, I know that Tassos was asked. Uh, you were talking about dealing with uh, languages, um, but dealing with languages in, in FCT, particularly when you're dealing with uh, ma um, analysis of massive amounts of data, we have quite a few issues to deal with. One. Um, there is what's known as a, a crazy languages, or there's, when I say crazy languages, I mean the language is, is crazy. There's types of a language that's uh, specific to a specific criminal group. So when they're talking about getting the stuff or going to the place, these things have their own meaning. So quite often you need to be able to actually have language processing technologies that you can actually build a specific corpus, a specific set of NLP tools, or have a specific domain for the type of crime that has to be adapted very, very rapidly. But there's much more fundamental problems as well. So for instance, um, the lack of uh, recall and coverage that you get from one language to another is distinct. You know, if you're going to process in English, it's one thing. If you're going to process in, in, in German, it's another. But we also get a lot of problems as well, particularly with transliteration. So quite often you'll have a case where you might have something in Arabic and it needs to be transli transliterated to Roman text or Roman letters. And in that particular case, uh, there are ISO standards for transliteration, but they're not observed. But even in the Arab speaking world, for instance, there is quite a significant difference in how they would use place name descriptions even. So transliteration and toponyms are a particular issue from one language to another, but also being able to deal with specific rare languages or being able to build uh, NLP tools that deal with a language that's specific to a group. Okay. Uh, um... uh, I I also have a second question to, to Shen. Um, it's about... Uh, Isaac, uh, sorry, sorry yes. before you go on, I would like to add here something to, to Sean. Uh, another challenge, uh, especially with, uh, uh, with uh, languages and textual data, is um, <clears throat> the use of uh, uh, case-specific and domain-specific uh, slang and also the, the way that... Uh, 
that younger people uh, uh, write with all the abbreviations and with all the, the, the symbols that are used. And this is uh, also an added, uh, added difficulty for, uh, for um, handling, uh, handling languages. Uh, so you also need to know the, the context and uh, you, you need to have translation capabilities also for, uh, for, for very specific uh, slang in order to, to get something out of the data. Thank you. Just a quick comment on that. Uh, so we're dealing with deviant spelling or particular slang or particular terminology. That, that's what I'm saying. You need to build your language rules almost specific to a case or specific target. Um, but um, also dealing with the translation capabilities, for instance, it's another thing that has to be borne in mind as well. You know, any of us that we need to understand a bit of a bit of Persian or Farsi, we can just go to Google Translate and see what it tells us. And um, quite often for law enforcement agencies and FCT, they can't do that. Uh, all must stay on premises and must stay within 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 their own systems and with their own applications. But Nizar, you said you had another question. Yes, thank you, Sean. Uh, it's about, um, we know that LEAs from different uh, European countries are not at the same um, stage for the adoption of AI or, uh, or AI technological development. Is it uh, an issue or an obstacle uh, to deal with when you're running a collaborative project? Or is it, um, for example, a particular uh, challenge or objective to tackle that you, 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 you give the you opportunity to a specific LEA to, to reach a, a given level? Um, so uh, there's something that's in my presentation, I didn't call it out. There's, um, there's problems that have been solved in other domains, um, like the health domain or the multimedia domain or uh, in the transport domain, that those technologies haven't found their way into the hands of uh, law enforcement agencies, for instance, that could be used to help solve problems that they think are huge problems. But you know, we've actually partly solved them in other domains or in other projects that can be adapted. But the thing about the level of capacity and capability of a law enforcement agency in a project, if you just assume that they're all they're all equal at the beginning of a project, you're gonna have you're gonna have a problem. What you need to do is actually organize a project around their own capabilities. And that could be just resources or training, but it can also actually be the experience or the operational experience of the agency. So you might have country X who has all the technology they 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 want. And they might have country Y who just happens to have dealt with a particular type of crime for a long time, for instance, disinformation in the, in the Baltic states or the Eastern European states, for instance. And then you have other countries that have neither. So you just, what I often try to do in a project is try to gently describe and place and position those law enforcement agencies within the limitations that they have in the, uh, in, in, within the project and then actually use as part of the project trying to show how the project has shown some progress or some advancement, some evolution in that law enforcement agency during the project. Actually use it as a benefit in the project if you can so, show some change. That's what I generally try to do. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. So, I think we, we give the floor to the next speaker. Uh, he is Pablo González from GMB, and uh, he will talk about artificial intelligence and uh, challenges in cybersecurity. Okay, thank you, Noria. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my, my name is Pablo. Uh, I work at GMB. Uh, specifically, I am leading the AI group at GMB, but uh, you may also know GMB from his long record on, on cybersecurity solutions and, and services. So uh, today, I want to enforce or reinforce, let us say, because many of my previous partners uh, presenting, they have to the same the same question here: is that um, how the AI is is not uh, it's not, it's not an option for the cybersecurity; it's a must. Okay, and and I'll try to 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 tell you why. Okay, uh, firstly, if we, if we look at the, at the figures or numbers for the cyber attacks, well, uh, first of all, this, these numbers are from Trend Micro Annual Cyber Security Report, but uh, you may know that uh, this, these figures, these numbers are for what uh, we are able to see. Uh, as you know, uh, 
cyber cyber crime is not uh, a regulated market precisely so this is only the, the part that we are we are able to see but uh, with this number uh, we are talking of more than uh, 60 billion to the threats reported uh, and blocked in, in this year, in the last year which translated to an average of uh, translated to seconds is 2000 uh, cyber threats per second on average and it's, uh, you can imagine that there will be peaks much much bigger okay this uh, this number means an, is an increase is 20 percent bigger than the this uh, than the previous year and uh, this uh, uh, this trend is being exponential since the well, since many years okay and as another example, a uh, trend uh, reported to uh, have detected uh, 40 million uh, unique phishing URLs. So these numbers are quite big. Okay. On the other side, uh, people that uh, we are defending uh, uh, against this cybercrime, uh, we have to, to face other challenges. For example, um, the, the surface we have to protect from our customers or from ourselves is is increasing because of the digitalization process in all companies are increasing their digital assets and uh, those, that means that we need to expand our efforts in protecting that also the these assets are even more more heterogeneous i mean it, it's not simply a uh, couple of computers or laptop uh, we are in, uh, using uh, mobile devices uh, iot's uh, a lot of uh, several devices uh, with uh, very difficult to protect okay. also the criminals the cyber crimes they are not sleeping okay uh, they are also <laughs> learning and adapting uh, very fast as, as we do so uh, they are not they are growing their attacks, but they are also learning to do it more complex and, and evading our defenses, okay? And uh, finally, uh, it is very difficult to find a skilled security expert, okay? It's, uh, it's very difficult, it's a very uh, um, uh, difficult to, to learn uh, skills, and people need several years to, to get ready to to, to face this this kind of problems, right? So uh, attackers are uh, better defenders. We have uh, many, so many challenges. We need help. I mean, it's uh, we have to change the strategy. We ca we cannot uh, rely only on human effort. Okay? We need the need for AI. Okay, and uh, I have uh, outlined here some ideas that uh, or places where AI, we think from GMB, that we could help to improve the, the work of the, the cybersecurity defenders. Okay? For example, uh, when talking about uh, preparing for the attacks, which is uh, preparing an IT asset inventory, uh, this is a very uh, big uh, amount of, of work that could be done automatically. Uh, could be do better by by machines than from humans. When calculating the probability of the company to come under attack, so this has been the threat exposure. Okay, uh, it is it is better uh, for an algorithm to to measure and to give a probability for uh, for that uh, specific threat uh, according to your uh, configuration, your network configuration, and also uh, we could also help. Uh, measuring the control and the efficiency of the controls uh, we have set up for preventing those those threats okay but also it could help when uh, trying to to defend right when the attack is is uh, ongoing uh, and this is mainly the part which is more uh, advanced in this uh, this domain is improving the security system okay with thanks to ai we can uh, detect better uh, due to um, analysis of patterns and, and behaviors, we can help uh, giving some context to the investigators, uh, several investigators. We have we can help filtering false positives and prioritization or automating uh, some of the tasks. 
And also we can help, uh, the AI can help uh, measuring the, the risk for interaction, okay? Given your, um, given your infrastructure and given the past is, we could uh, forecast the likelihood, uh, which is the, the most probably uh, intrusion vector for your, for your company. And finally, uh, once the incident has taken, up, has, has taken place, uh, we could also, AI could also help uh, with the response of the incident, okay? Uh, providing, again, context for, for people working on this task and prioritization, prioritization of the task that they need to do in order to recover the, the asset to this previous state, okay? And also, uh, it is very important, although it's not a, a help more than a challenge, but I, I would like to point it out that um, all these uh, mechanisms and, and techniques and algorithms that, that we are going to put in place for helping the, uh, the cybersecurity defenders is that the recommendation analysis must be explainable. It is not that uh, deep learning techniques are very powerful, but uh, they are very hard to explain. And, this is a, a trade-off we have to work on uh, to identify which is the best algorithms and best strategies and not being too complex so that humans, which is at the end is the one who, who are working on this, uh, are able to understand what's happening behind the, the scenes. Okay, and, and that's, that's all my presentation. The, please uh, keep in mind that uh, cybersecurity needs AI. It's, it's not an option, it's a must. And, and we need them to cope with the worldwide increase in cyber attacks. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Pablo, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we ha you have a question. Uh, it says, the attack surface and the pandemia, any comments on where you have new threats this last year and a half that you yeah. have been? Jeff, of course, this, this year has been, uh, this year and the past, the previous one, it's been a, <laughs> a hell, let's say that, but because everybody is working from home, uh, the perimeter has exploded, uh, everybody uh, needs to connect remotely from, from their uh, home networks, unsecured networks at the end. And well, it's, uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot remember the numbers, but uh, we are, talking about uh, doubling or triple of the efforts in order to, to, to protect that perimeter. Okay. Uh, this is the, the, there was only one question. So thanks a lot for your speech. And we are going through Cedric Uji Peye. Um, with the session misuse and abuse of artificial intelligence in the security field. Get the floor. Yes, good afternoon. Thank, thank you, thank you, Noria. In this talk, I will, uh, I will talk about the specific problems raised by the use of artificial intelligence. The camera, Cedric. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Specifically, we will focus on three specific topics. Uh, first, understanding artificial intelligence limitations and how interpretability and fairness play a crucial uh, so, Sorry, Frederick, now the presentation. Sorry? The, pre we, the, we, the slides. We cannot see your presentation, Cedric. <laughs> Is it okay? Yeah, it's okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I just uh, begin again with this slide. Sorry, but the, the, the first one was this one. And so, uh, yes, I said first, uh, we will uh, specifically consider uh, understanding artificial intelligence limitations and how interpretability and fairness play a crucial role in this topic. Uh, second, a lesser known set of risks about privacy 
and uh, how privacy is raised by the use of artificial intelligence and especially deep learning based artificial intelligence. And third, we will try to clearly explain the concept and clearly and quickly explain the concept of adversarial risks in the context of AI and its implication in critical contexts. So in its simplest form, the common approach of building a supervised AI is depicted in this figure. On top right, you can see the main building block of AI consists in building a mapping between data, like signals, images, or sounds, and the predefined high-level class, like dog or, or, or cat. The crucial steps to have in mind are, first, we have data acquisition, in which you want to sample the concept to build a training data set. And of course, they can introduce a lot of biases. Then from a training data sets, uh, we have a lot of options to build AI models, like deep learning, uh, forest-based models, and so on, with their inherent weaknesses and strengths. And lastly, we have, when we go from virtual world to real world, we have crucial issues that come in play when you go from training world to the reality. And this is the bottom of the slide. And at this step, various problems can arise, from non-stationarity to emerging behaviors that are not present in the training datasets. Thus, entering into details of how AI is built raises questions about trust that we can put in AI. And indeed, trust is key, and especially in the field of security, it has the potential to enhance AI acceptability. Based on, on knowledge about how AI is built, we split the notion of trust into three main parts. First, let's not forget that performance is key and quantitative evaluation raises issues for AI. Second, transparency, in the sense that we are able to use interpretable model or provide the user with explainable decisions, as mentioned in the, in the previous tools. And lastly, in the security field, as for legal entity authorities, a key feature of trustworthy AI is accountability. We will focus in this talk on privacy and specific risks encountered when using AI in the security field. One not so known issue of machine learning models is that AI models carry out crucial information. First, about the will of the model owner, like for enterprise, the will of, 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 their, uh, of their business, and the training data used for training. Such that releasing a model raises a number of risks, and the research community has been very active to highlight, understand, and mitigate those risks. Here are a few examples. At the center of the slides, uh, you, you can see that Building a model is uh, represented by the green arrow. While attacking a model, it wants to train to infer information about the model or the training data. Some specific examples in, for example, membership inference attacks in top left of the slide, attackers can build a methodology for determining whether a specific example has been used for training the model. And bottom left, uh, we know that in model extraction attack literature, researchers have shown that some machine learning models with enough budget can be recovered by a single access to an inference API. And lastly, on right, you have an example of model inversion in which researchers have even shown that some information about training images can be recovered from the own knowledge of the model. Many countermeasures have been proposed in the literature, including differential privacy techniques, which is the, the state-of-the-art approach to deal with these questions. But a lot of work is still needed to preserve privacy. In this context, and given risks in sharing data between organizations, especially in governmental organizations, federated learning appears as a potential solution. 
The idea on, the, on left is that the methodology allows you to build a model from non-disclosed data by just gathering model weights and iteratively aggregating. As shown in paper by Nelly Setal, attacks are still possible in this context. And it's crucial to take into account risks from previous slides in building federated framework in the field of security. Last but not least, recent work from 2014-2013 on deep learning have shown that neural networks cannot be compared with humans in terms of perception. Differences have been illustrated and exploited for building adversarial attacks. The rationale behind adversarial attacks is that a tiny perturbation of the image obtained by gradient optimization and imperceptible to humans can fool the decision of the neural networks. The existence of adversarial examples pose the huge questions about the robustness of AI. In this short video, we will illustrate the concept of adversarial examples in a traffic science recognition application. So let's take the analogy between a neural network on right with a Galton board on left. In this analogy, we will consider that training amounts to adjusting weights in neural networks. And adjusting weights in the neural networks is like on the Galton board, adjusting orientations in the playboards. And as you see, the traffic sign, which is depicted here with the ball, and the AI is now able to recognize traffic signs. In this context, adversarial examples are built by just modifying a few pixels in the images. And this tiny modification exploits some instabilities of the, of the decision process, such that the final decision is completely wrong and it, it exploits the, the complexity of neural network to fool the decision. Adversarial ex examples and adversarial attacks exist in images, but also in sounds or any applications involving neural networks, and especially deep neural networks. Recent demonstrations have shown that speech recognition, for example, can be attacked by such techniques. Defenses are being actively developed against this kind of attacks, but attacks are also stronger and even more robust in the physical world. Research is that still needed in this direction. To conclude, the use of AI in the field of security poses crucial challenges on performances, interpretability, privacy, and robustness to attacks. Ambitious projects gathering people from various horizons are still necessary to address these challenges. AI is, of course, needed, as Pablo mentioned in the previous talk, uh, but it has a lot to bring, uh, of course, in the security field, but it should be done with care and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric, for your presentation. Um, I don't see any questions. If I am wrong, no, there's no questions up to now. So thanks a lot for your presentation. And we pass the floor to Vito. Uh, that will make uh, generate some discussion on future activities of the group and um, I will close the workshop. Okay, I guess you see my slide. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the intent of this uh, last uh, uh, talk is to uh, try to sum up some of the the, the concept that we discussed uh, during during the past uh, one hour and fifty minutes, more or less, and also to to say something uh, related to the 
the the the working group and the the, the ne next activities that we are going to to activate to kick off uh, uh, with the working group first of all i just want to uh, make uh, some order on the relationship between the ai uh, and security uh, so of course we know that uh, ai can be used to empower security uh, security solution but uh, so it is uh, ai4 uh, of course we have uh, uh, also the problem of uh, security of ai which is not only um, cyber security it is also uh, physical security and uh, uh, last but not least uh, there is the problem of uh, uh, security threats or attacks um, powered by ai or empowered by ai so uh, it's important to 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 consider these three phases uh, i would say of the same coin but the problem is we have only two phases in the coin uh, but three phases uh, of the of the problem uh, it is also important to say that uh, um just uh, i'm just trying to to click okay that uh, according also to the uh the rest of the activities in the in the bdva dairo uh we uh, decided we discussed and we decided to consider um only the parts uh, uh, that are inside the box uh, uh, as a, a part of the scope uh, of uh, um, the activities uh, in the working group in the security working group at the bdva uh, the security of the AE system will be part of uh, some other activities, uh, some other task forces, so it's important also to state uh, this. Of course, uh, as you can see in the, in the picture, there are some overlappings, uh, and these overlappings uh, cannot be uh, excluded uh, during, uh, during our discussion. Some other uh, important notes. AI at least uh, in the in the in the scope of our uh, activities is not only machine learning for uh, big data processing and analytics so uh, most of the i would say yeah most of the presentation that you have listened to uh, this afternoon uh, uh, made also some example of uh, uh, ai not directly applied to 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 data processing only uh, because, of course, there are autonomous systems, uh, autonomous drones, autonomous uh, uh, vehicles. So there are autonomous uh, entities that can also uh, can include, of course, machine learning, but it is not only machine learning. Um, the other point is that uh, AI, especially in security, is not supposed to replace humans. Uh, because there are some capabilities, uh, if you just consider the case of the investigation, the investigator that cannot be replaced by any, uh, even though sophisticated, but uh, AI system, so it's not possible. Uh, I just want to put some additional uh, um, points that are related to the problem AI and security or AI for security and uh, uh, the activities related to the working group. First of all, uh, there is a more uh, sophistication in the threats, in the attack, in the security threats, in the security act. So this is something that uh, uh, it is uh, now a reality, including the IB threats. Uh, then there is another dimension that should be considered, which is the uh, technology technological, organization, and operational uh, sovereignty uh, at the different uh, uh, member states, in some cases also within the same uh, uh, member states. And of course, there are different uh, uh, laws and uh, regulations. So I think this is also a, a dimension to consider when we consider AI uh, for, uh, uh, for security or in the context of security. We have also to consider uh, something that we are experiencing these days, so the, some uh, um, events, some uh, crisis, extreme crisis that uh, can be considered as a multiplier. And of course, uh, uh, as also mentioned by 
uh, Pablo, if I remember, uh, the, the, this is, uh, uh, for instance, the case of cybersecurity, uh, and of course, uh, this uh, introduces an additional uh, uh, challenge. Uh, most mo, mo, very important is the, the problem of the non-technical topics. Also, this one was mentioned by, by other colleagues before, but, uh, and uh, Sean, I think, uh, uh, mentions several of them. But when you talk about AI uh, in the context of security, you have to consider trustworthiness, acceptance, accountability, ethics, uh, social, societal aspects. So there are, there are a lot of things that uh, must be considered in this context. Uh, one important additional dimension is the concept of data spaces, because of course, this is something that according to the day, European data strategy must be considered, even if uh, in the security context, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, more challenging than in other sector, of course. Uh, this should be part of the game. Uh, the, we, we should consider also the concept of res resilience. Uh, I think uh, Gabriele mentioned something uh, related to this uh, for critical infrastructure protection. And normally this is a concept uh, that you see in the context of critical infrastructure protection or in disaster resilience societies. But uh, this is a concept that should be uh, uh, more present also in the other security areas. Uh, so going beyond security and protection uh, uh, towards the resilience. Uh, the European digital autonomy is also something that must be considered, uh, is it is also considered in the context of the uh, security union as uh, uh, Nizar uh, was explaining at the very beginning. Uh, and of course, uh, this must be considered in the context of security solutions uh, including AI-based security solutions. Um, let me go, okay. Another dimension to consider, which uh, is also relevant for our working group, is the integration between the physical and the cyber. So these uh, will create some sort of overlapping, not only between uh, the three bolts that you see in the screen, but also uh, between the different uh, security areas, because cybersecurity is, uh, uh, and oh, let's say the digital, uh, security and the digital aspects of security uh, are normally included in any of the areas. Um, uh, important, another element which is important is the interdependencies uh, uh, between the different entities that normally are considered. Could be different systems at the member state level, could be different assets within the same critical infrastructure, could be different system in a context of uh, 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 disaster resilience uh, uh, scenario. So, of course, and uh, it is also important to address uh, the, the problem of, a, of the interdependencies among uh, these uh, entities and, of course, uh, the cascading effect, uh, uh, which is a context, again, a context, uh, a concept which is uh, uh, normally addressed in the, in the area of critical infrastructure protection, but they should also be considered when you, uh, uh, you, 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 you consider the AI for, uh, for security. Uh, again, uh, um, last but not least, uh, uh, and this is also uh, mentioned and referred in the, in the proposal for regulation on AI uh, published a couple of weeks ago, or just a few weeks ago, is the concept of sandboxes. So the point is not only uh, sharing data uh, for research, it's not only um, creating uh, proper data sets uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, AI research for security, but create environments that can be put, or realistic environments that can be put uh, uh, at the services of the law enforcement, first responders, uh, the security practitioners, uh, in order to test not only the data or the data set or the algorithms, but world system, including uh, uh, AI, and especially in this case, uh, uh, data-driven AI, AI solutions. Okay. Uh, just to conclude, 
uh, and also uh, repeating uh, uh, what needs are already anticipated during the the initial uh, the initial talk uh, uh, on the uh, security working group within uh, BDVA. Uh, we are going to organize uh, this uh, uh, brokerage event. I think uh, it is something that now can be done considering that the deadline uh, should be moved, should be postponed to November. So there is, uh, uh, I think, time uh, also to, to, to discuss on this. Uh, the, the, the point is to uh, collect ideas not competencies or skills uh, by by the, the partner. Of course, there are other wider uh, events that uh, can be used to, to present uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, skills or this kind of interest. Uh, the idea is to exploit within the uh, BDVA context uh, uh, the possibility to try to see, to explore the possibility to create uh, uh relevant groups relevant proposal coming from uh, uh, bdva second point uh, already anticipated also by nizar um, the creation of this work uh, focus group of course uh, the focus groups uh, let's call them uh, sub working groups uh, uh, they are uh, uh closely related to the security areas, so infra critical infrastructure protection, border security, fight against crime and terrorism, cybersecurity, and disaster resilient societies. But as uh, we were discussing before, uh, these are not silos. They are uh, uh, interacting groups, but the idea is just to the to use the, 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 the usual concept of divide et impera in order to uh, organize in a more effective and efficient way the activities within the, 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 these focus groups or sub-working groups. Uh, of course, uh, we will be looking for uh, candidates to uh, lead uh, these, uh, for leading these uh, focus groups and uh, we, will, uh, we will organize this. Uh, the last point, uh, as already mentioned by uh, Nizar, is also the, the white paper. Of course, uh, the idea is to, to, to keep this structure, but uh, to highlight uh, also the interaction, the interdependencies, the common challenges that you can see, uh, in, you can see among the different uh, focus uh, groups, focus area, security area, uh, wherever the, the you, you 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 define them uh, as you can see in the in the picture uh, in the slide uh, of course of course there are these pillars but uh, if you look uh, on the left uh, at the crimes uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> interactions uh, between the different areas so some crimes or some threats uh, are common to the different areas so it's important to consider the specificity specificities uh, of the uh the different security area and there are some of course uh, there are different problems there are different needs there are different contexts and different constraints if you consider the border if you consider fct or drs but of course there are also common uh, challenges and also common uh, opportunities uh that could be that is important in a white paper uh, uh, like the one that we are aiming at to 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 try to highlight these uh, common parts i think that's it from my side Okay, thank you, Vito, for your presentation. I think we we are running out of time. So uh, thank you, everybody, for your attendance. And we expect you can participate as much as possible in our working group. Thank and, you. And again, thank you very much, Nuria, for uh, the organization of uh, uh, this session, this workshop. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nuria.